In this video, I present you the most legendary bouts in the history of Olympic Judo of the 20th century. These are the bouts of the greatest judokas of the past, which forever entered the history of the Olympic Games and left a huge mark in the world of Judo. These bouts not only inspired thousands of athletes, but also changed the game itself. Get ready to see some truly historic Judo moments. The 1964 Japanese Olympics inevitably meant a great deal of interest in Judo. Needless to say, the sport was associated by many with Japan, and local fans were expecting to see gold medals won by their athletes. Not least in the category that many in Tokyo considered the most prestigious at the 1964 Olympics, the Open category. It was the first gold medal of the Games, but, to the shock of many, it was won not by a Japanese athlete, but by a European, Anton Giesink from the Netherlands. His victory should not have come as a surprise, because Giesink's path to the 1964 competition showed his tremendous ability. In 1961 he became the first non-Japanese judoka to win the world title, and he came to the 1964 Olympic Games as the favorite. The Japanese picked Akio Kaminaga, but he was nearing the end of his career, the pinnacle of which was a world championship silver in 1958. In the first round, Kaminaga and Gisink were paired together, and Gisink won by decision of the judges. However, Kaminaga still advanced to the semifinals, where he beat German Klaus Glenn in a hard-fought match. Gisink's semifinal was the exact opposite. He fought the Australian Theodore Bernovskis and won by just 12 seconds to make the final already a repeat bout against Kaminaga. Competing in the final, they fought on equal terms for a long nine minutes. The atmosphere was tense and expected, but then Kaminaga launched an attack and his Dutch opponent counter-attacked and knocked the Japanese to the ground. A few seconds later, the referee counted upon and Giesink won. The second time judo was featured in the Olympics was not at the 1968 Mexico City Games, but eight years later in the 1972 Munich Games. Like many others in the judo world, then IJF President Charles Palmer was shocked when he first found out, in 1966, that judo had not been included in the Mexico City Games. He immediately petitioned hard for judo's inclusion but it was already too late. The program had been set. He did, however, manage to get judo back into the games for the 1972 Olympics, and this time, it was not an optional sport but a permanent one. The world of judo has also changed. More players, from more countries, had emerged onto the scene, and there were many new faces too. Anton Giesink, the giant Dutchman whom the Japanese feared, had by then retired. But he had been succeeded by another massive Dutchman Willem Ruska, who perhaps displayed less flair but was probably more powerful than Giesink. Ruska had decided to compete in both the heavyweight division and the open, which raised the tantalizing prospects of two judo gold medals in the same Olympics. Unlike Giesink, who had a more orthodox style of gripping, Ruska preferred to adopt a double lapel grip from which he could launch into her Igoshi, his favorite technique. Sometimes from that same grip, he could also switch to a Sotogari, to throw to the back or Tayotoshi, to throw to the front. As expected, Ruska whizzed through his first two matches against Eugenie Bancasu of Morocco and Douglas Nelson of the United States, throwing both of them for a pawn. This brought him up against Japan's Motoki Nishimura in the semifinals. Nishimura was not a particularly distinguished player. His biggest success prior to the Olympics was his win in that year's Asian Championships. However, in Munich he did give Ruska a really tough fight. Their semi-final went to full time with neither men able to throw the other. In the end Ruska won by a decision. In the final, Ruska was not only fighting a capable opponent but the home crowd as well. Klaus Glenn of West Germany was a bronze medalist from the Tokyo Olympics and he had won the silver medal at three successive World Championships, 1967, 1969 and 1971, leading up to the Munich Games. Glenn was a very seasoned fighter but Ruska was too powerful. In just under two minutes, Ruska smashed him to the ground with a dynamic Haraigoshi for a pawn. At the 1972 Munich Olympics, the main favorite in the category up to 93 kilograms was Japanese Fumio Sesehara, world champion in 1969 and 1971. Prior to the competition, no one had even heard of the Soviet Union's Shoda Chochishvili, a fresh-faced 22-year-old fighter from Georgia. 
Few also considered Britain's David Starbrook, whose best results up to that point was a world bronze, to be a top contender for the gold. But this was the Olympics and anything can happen. Chakishvili's judo was quite typical of players who hailed from Georgia. His Hsioyan age, for example, was done from a cross grip, and he was fully capable of doing the Georgian pickup that would later be known as the Cabrelli. But his main throw was Urine age. He started off well, defeating Cha Duyong of North Korea in his first match. However, the luck of the draw meant that his next bout would be against the favorite, Sesahara. Chakishvili's Olympic journey was about to be over almost as soon as it began, but the unexpected happened. In a move that stunned the judo world, Chokishvili took a cross grip, swung Sesahara around and slammed him flat on his back for an ippon. Next up, he was up against Britain's Starbrook. After facing Japan's double world champion, Cho Chishvili should have found this match to be much easier. But it wasn't. In a very closely fought battle, the referee's decision went to Starbrook. Cho Chishvili's defeat meant that Cesare's chance to fight for a bronze medal had evaporated. The Japanese would not have a medal of any color in this division. Ironically, Cho Chishvili himself still had a chance for gold. Under the unusual repetitive system of the time, it was possible for him to claw his way up to the final. And that's exactly what happened. Cho Chishvili defeated Pierre Albertini of France, Paul Barth of Australia and James Woolley of United States to earn the right to face Starbrook again in the final. All Starbrook had to do was repeat his earlier win, and he would be Olympic champion. But his young Georgian opponent, clearly still smarting from his earlier defeat, had other plans and attacked aggressively from the start. Cho Chishvili very nearly scored with the foot technique that took Starbrook to the ground. The Briton attacked back, but none of his moves came close to scoring. The match went to full time and the referee's decision rightly went to Cho Chishvili. Chokishvili's unexpected win made him a hero in his home country of Georgia. That Olympic moment in 1972 was his peak. Cho Chishvili would not be able to win another major international title after that, although he did go on to win a world bronze and an Olympic bronze. Remarkably, Cho Chishvili never won a European championship gold. His best results at the European level were three European silver medals. At the 1972 Olympics, there were three main contenders in the open weight division, Willem Ruska of the Netherlands, Vitaly Kuznetsov of the Soviet Union and Masadoshi Shinomaki from Japan. On paper, the top favorite was Ruska, for he had won the heavyweight division on day one. But Shinomaki was a double world champion in the open weight division. In 1969, he defeated Ruska in the world championship final. And in 1971, he defeated Kuznetsov. So, Japan was definitely in the running for the open weight gold. Ruska and Kuznetsov were both in the same pool and the unthinkable happened. The Russian surprised Ruska with a wrestling-style pickup and smashed him to the mat. The other big upset was when West Germany's Klaus Glenn defeated Shinomaki. Fortunately for Ruska, the unique repetitive system back then made it possible for him to claw his way into the final, and he did just that by defeating Chiaki Ishii of Brazil, West Germany's Glenn and Jean-Claude Brandoni of France. This allowed him to face Kuznetsov once again, this time for gold. Having gotten thrown with a pickup technique earlier, Ruska didn't take any chances. He knocked the Russian down with an Ashiguruma and immediately clamped on Yoko Shiogatami. With the second gold medal in sight, there was no way Ruska was going to let go. His grip was so tight, Kuznetsov didn't even put up much of a struggle. Toen de 30 seconden om waren, kon Ruska jubelend de armen heffen. Aan het zwijgewicht goud had hij goud voor alle categorieën toegevoegd. And with that, Ruska superseded his countryman, the legendary Anton Giesink, by becoming the first judo player in history to win two Olympic gold medals. After the Olympics, Ruska announced his retirement. He had won everything worth winning in judo, two Olympic golds, two World Championships golds, and seven European Championships golds. In the lightest weight category at the 76 Olympics in Montreal, no one expected much from Cuban judoka Hector Rodriguez, bronze medalist at the 73 World Championships. Meanwhile, Rodriguez steadily worked his way to the final, often throwing his opponents with the kimata, a technique he picked up while training in North Korea. He saw a player there using that technique and vowed to master it himself. He worked hard on it and in Montreal, it had become his tokuyuaza. Rodriguez's opponent in the finals was South Korea's Chang Yun Kyung, who specialized in Murotsuyen age. And indeed it was with that technique that Chang opened up with at the start of the match. 
Almost as if he was expecting it, Rodriguez countered the Marozio and Age with a perfectly timed Casodogari for Coca. Moments later, Chang managed to slip underneath Rodriguez and roll him over with Marozio and Age for Coca. A minute had not even passed into scores were already on the board. This was the kind of all-action judo final fans love. With the scores even, Rodriguez tried to get ahead with Uchigari. This time, it was Chang who was prepared for the attack and countered Rodriguez so effectively, he had the Cuban in the air. It was only Rodriguez's agility that allowed him to avoid conceding a score. Around the 7-minute mark, Rodriguez came in with his favorite technique, the Ukimata, and launched Chang high into the air. Only Yuko was given although it could have easily been a Wazari. Chang attacked relentlessly with Marozio in age, putting Rodriguez on the defensive. At one point, upon hitting the ground while evading yet another Marozio in age attempt, Rodriguez seemed to have injured himself. The medic ended up wrapping his torso with bandages and play was allowed to continue. It was only later that Rodriguez revealed he had gotten injured during training in the lead up to the games. It was obvious that Rodriguez was badly hampered by his injury. Cheng poured on the pressure, regularly attacking with Marozio in age. Although he could not score, he managed to get Rodriguez penalized to Kuo for passivity. That gave him a Yuko, so that meant he had a Yuko and a Coca on the board. Rodriguez, meanwhile, had thrown Cheng for a Yuko and a Coca, but he had an additional Coca because Cheng had also received a Shido. So, in the end, Rodriguez was ahead by the smallest of margins, a Coca. The referee, who seemed confused, initially gave the match to Chang, who raised his arms into the air to celebrate. He seemed to want to get off the mat as soon as possible but the referee quickly corrected his mistake and awarded the victory to Rodriguez, who became Cuba's first ever Olympic judo gold medalist. At the 70 to Munich Olympics, the Japanese were not very successful, winning only three of the six gold medals. For any other country, winning 50% of the medals would have been a huge success, but not for the Japanese. The national team made up for lost time the following year at the 73 World Championships in Lausanne, where Japan won gold in all six categories. At the 75 World Championships in Vienna, Japan was not as successful, although four of the six gold medals were still a good result. There wasn't an expectation that Japan would win every weight class in Montreal but there certainly was an expectation that they would improve upon their performance in Munich. Japan went to Montreal brimming with confidence. The absence of a seeding system back then meant who top players would face in the first round was based purely on the luck of the draw. Sometimes the top players would find themselves facing each other early on in the contest, and that's exactly what happened in the heavyweight division. At the 75 World Championships in Vienna, Sumio Endo of Japan and Sergei Novikov of the Soviet Union fought in the heavyweight final. The Japanese became the champion there and therefore went to the Olympics in Montreal as the favorite in the heavyweight division. Endo's main opposition in Montreal was bound to be Novikov. As it turned out, they did have a rematch but as luck would have it, they were drawn together in the first round. What should have been an exciting match worthy of the final turned out to be a rather boring affair as both players were wary of the other. In the end, Novikov got a decision win. Novikov must have been relieved that he got Endo out of the way so early on but that didn't mean it was smooth sailing for him after that. His next opponent, Peck Jong-il of North Korea, in particular, proved to be a difficult opponent to handle. Peck's over 2 meter frame made it hard for Novikov to throw him with his favorite Osotogari. In the end, Novikov managed to scrape through with the smallest of scores, a coca for an urine age. After that, Novikov powered his way through to the final, defeating Redimir Kovacevic of Yugoslavia and Keith Remfrey of Great Britain. His opponent in the final was the capable German player, Gunther Neureuther. If the spectators were disappointed with a lack of big throws from Novikov thus far, they would not be disappointed with the final. The match began with some power gripping by both players. Neureuther tried to get a high grip while Novikov preferred to go for a less traditional double lapel grip with his right hand holding mid lapel and his left hand around the armpit area. There was much heavy gripping going on but not much by way of attacks. This prompted the referee to give each of them a penalty for passivity. Neuroyder tried to make an underhook, but Novikov responded with a powerful Sotogari throw, which caused the German to roll over and fall on his back. Novikov immediately clutched him in case the Ippon was replaced by Wazari, but there was no chance of that. The throw was so strong that the stadium erupted in thunderous applause. Novikov had given the crowd the kind of Olympic final they wanted to see. 
In the 1970s, it was very rare that a Japanese was not the favorite for a gold medal, but this was the case in the 70 kilograms division in Montreal. The top prospect there was Vladimir Nevzorov of the Soviet Union, the reigning world champion from 1975. He was also the European champion that year. Nevzorov was a unique Soviet judoka, for although he did have a sambo wrestling background, his judo style was somewhat classical, with Ukimata and Taiotoshi being his favorite techniques. Although he was widely admired for his technical wizardry, he was also an extremely hard worker. He was an inspiration for Alexander Yatskevich, a famous Soviet player whose name is synonymous with the rolling jujigatami that is very popular, even to this day. I always remember seeing Nevzorov in training camps, Yatskevich wrote in his book, Russian Judo. Not only was he particularly gifted, he also trained harder than anyone else. Yatskevich recalled seeing Nevzorov always staying back in the dojo after the formal session was over to work on techniques or to do some conditioning training. The Japanese knew they had a tough fight ahead in the 70 kilograms division because Nevzorov had beaten their player, Koji Kuramoto, in the 75 World Championships. There was no reason to suggest the outcome would be any different this time. As expected, Nevzorov blitzed through the preliminary rounds, beating his opponents from Poland, Switzerland and Australia by Ipon. Even South Korea's representative, Lee Chang-sun, could not stop him and succumbed to the inevitable Taiotoshi for Ipon. Kuramoto had a harder time in the prelims, winning only one match by Ipon, but he made his way to the final for a rematch with Nevzorov. The outcome of that match was to be a formality, but it very nearly didn't go as planned. As expected, Nevzorov dominated, throwing Kuramoto twice with his lightning-quick cross-grip Taiotoshi. The first one scored Koka, but the second one could have easily been in upon. Even the Japanese coach, Aisao Okano, was reported to have said afterwards that the second Taiotoshi was indeed worthy of Enipon. Nevertheless, only a Wazari was given. Kuramoto had a second lease of life and he very nearly turned Nevzorov into a hold down in the final seconds of the match. But Nevzorov managed to stay largely on his belly until the timer rang, giving him the win. <laughs> I suggest recalling the performance of the legendary judoka Angelo Parisi at the 1980 Olympic Games in Moscow. The Moscow Olympics were marred by a boycott leady by the United States, which resulted in Japan, South Korea and West Germany refusing to participate. This had a great impact on judo. Japan's absence inevitably meant that the level of competition would be lower. Japan usually wins at least half of the gold medals. But it also meant more chances for other countries to win, which was certainly the case in the heavyweight division, where Japan had two real superstars. One was the very experienced Sumio Endo, who won the Open division at the 79 World Championships, and the other was rising star Yasuhiro Yamashita, who won the plus 95 kilograms division at the 79 World Championships. There is no doubt that they would have won the Open and plus 95 kilograms divisions at the Moscow Olympics had they participated. In Moscow, the star of the show in the over 95 kilograms category was Frenchman Angelo Parisi, who changed his British citizenship after marrying a French woman and moving to France. Parisi showed great potential early in his career and won a bronze medal at the 72 Olympic Games in Munich. His decision to change citizenship prevented him from competing in the 76 Olympics in Montreal. But by 1980, he was free to compete for his new country. Parisi was an unusual heavyweight in that he was not very large and he moved around like a lightweight. His favorite grip was a double lapel grip, which prevented his opponents from knowing which side he was going to throw towards. He threw his first opponent, Wojciech Raszko of Poland with a dynamic Sionage and Eshigurama combination, which had the big pole flying through the air. But as Wojciech managed to spin out and avoid landing on his back, only a Yuko was scored. This was enough to win Parisi the match, though. He did even better in his next match, throwing Vladimir Kokman of Czechoslovakia for a pawn with another Marozio in age from a double lapel grip. Parisi's semi-final match was against Britain's Paul Redburn, another relatively lighter heavyweight who also likes to move around a lot. Their similar styles cancelled each other out and no score was recorded. In the end, Parisi won through penalties. 
Preez's final match was against Dimitar Zoprianov of Bulgaria who was more than 30 kilograms heavier. Although Paris could throw to both sides, in Moscow he seemed to favor the left. In his first two matches, he threw both his opponents towards the left. In fact, he tried to do the same with Zoprianov to nearly disastrous results. The big Bulgarian countered him for what could easily have been an Ipon, but for some reason only a Yuko was given. This gave Paris a new lease of life and he made the most of it. With only about a minute left in the match, Parisi danced around Zoprianov and slipped past his arms to launch him with a massive standing Marotsiu in H to the right. And upon was scored to thunderous applause from the audience, who probably had never seen a heavyweight throw like that before. Although Yamashita could not participate in Moscow due to the boycott, he was there to watch the judo competition. After the whole event was over, he was quoted as saying that Parisi was the only player worth watching. It would have been interesting to have seen Parisi in his prime go up against Yamashita, who was also peaking at the time. As it turned out, although both players had long careers, they never once crossed paths on the competition mat. 